One thing I discovered in my research is that many of the things that are blamed on global warming um, are, or blamed on greenhouse gases are actually, at least to a large extent, caused by disruptions in the hydrological cycle, uh, disruptions to water, especially floods and droughts, uh, but also even rising temperatures. Water is, well, so for one thing, water vapor is uh, the dominant greenhouse gas on Earth, but its effects are a lot harder to model because for one thing, it's not globally distributed in a relatively uniform way as carbon is. Some areas there's a lot of it, some of the areas there's not very much. And also the effect on temperature that water has depends on the form that it's in. If it's haze, then it has a warming effect because it's a greenhouse gas. But when it forms clouds, it has a cooling effect, especially during the day. At night, it actually has a little bit of a warming effect. It also depends on, on how high the clouds are. So this is really hard to model. Therefore, it is not very effectively modeled. Even making it even harder is that the formation of clouds is influenced by life. Cloud formation is seeded by uh, aromatic chemicals that are given off by, by plants and seeded by bacteria that that, crisp, that, that have ice nucleating proteins on them that allow clouds to form at a lower altitude, which means that they reflect, that they have a stronger cooling effect if they're at a lower altitude. Um, water, so when, when, you, when you look at the world through the lens of water, it gives birth to a different set of priorities than looking at the world through the lens of carbon, although there is actually a large area of intersection, because the best way to heal water is through soil and forests and, and wetlands and, and some other ecosystems too. But mostly I'll, I'll concentrate on soil and forests. In a healthy system, what happens? The water cycle is as follows. The rain falls on the earth and it is soaked up completely with almost no runoff because the soil, healthy soil is like a sponge. It's penetrated, but it's, it's very thick um, or it's covered with, with layers of leaf litter and, and plants. It's penetrated by mycelia, uh, by, by roots and, and, and um, mycorrhizae and, 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 and earthworms and animals. And, um, and so the, so the, the rain comes and it soaks down, 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 down um, some of it stays in the soil and some of it sinks all the way down to the water table uh, and, and into the deeper, deeper aquifers. And once it's in the soil, then over time, the trees can pull it up and they transpire it through the leaves. This water then, it, so it evaporates from the leaves. It forms new clouds that are in part seeded by the trees themselves. And then it comes back down as rain. So what happens when you cut down the trees or you plow up the grasses? The grasses do some, some of the same thing. What happens then? And you have bare soil. Well, the rain comes and because there's no roots holding it in place and because, especially if you've been spraying chemicals on it because the soil is depleted of life, then it's no longer such a sponge. And some of it maybe soaks in, but a lot of it runs off carrying the soil with it, or it evaporates. It, has, it stands in puddles, and you've seen like the, you've seen like these pictures, you know, of the parched, cracked earth that happens after the rain has fallen and evaporates. So now you have, you don't have the trees feeding the rains for days and weeks and months after the rain, rainy season is over. Instead, you have a drought. And the, the parched earth, the exposed soil, not to mention parking lots and, and asphalt and things like that, that creates um, a lot of sensible heat that creates high pressure zones that prevent new 
um, moist air from even coming in. So cities and cultivated agricultural land can push away the rains into uninhabited areas, into the mountains, for example, intensifying the rains there and causing flooding, which is exacerbated by the fact that the soil can't soak up so much water anymore. And the wetlands have been drained. These are sponges for, for rainwater. So now you're getting, where, where, whereas before you had reliable rains, now you have a flood drought cycle. And then it gets blamed on climate change, which excuses you from doing anything about your agricultural practices or your forestry practices. One of the principles that I, I, I like to work with or use as a, uh, a conceptual lens is the principle that life creates the conditions for life. So healthy forests, not only do they recycle water that has that originally comes in from the oceans, um, they actually bring water in from the oceans because they because they they transpire so much water. When that this is called the biotic pump, this theory, it, it the water rises, condenses, the condensation creates a low pressure zone that then pulls air in from far away, uh, ultimately from over the oceans. So you're bringing new moisture in. In Brazil, they call it the flying rivers. And when you cut down the forests, everybody knows, this is vernacular knowledge, that the rains stop coming, that forests and water have an intimate relationship. So there's way, way more I could talk about with water. I could talk about the, the damage caused by exterminating beavers that, and by straightening waterways and by building dams um, because the beavers used to slow down the water. A lot of what are streams today were not streams 200 years ago and, and, and were not wearing these deep channels, but they were more of like a series of water terraces because there were five or 10 beaver dams per mile. On, on the old maps, places that are, are where there's a stream now that was once just the middle of a marsh or a bog or something like that. So beavers and, and other animals and, and plants, they maintain a healthy water cycle. And when you uh, disrupt that, then all kinds of chaos arises floods and droughts, and higher temperatures too. I, I looked at these, there's a um, whole bunch of research coming from this group of Slovakian um, hydrologists. And one of the maps, I remember, they have um, uh, uh, an area of land with different uh, land uses, different topographical features. There's a forest, there's a parking lot, there's a, a cultivated field, uh, there's a lake, and the they, um, the map has the temperature over each of these different uh, micro regions. And, and, you know, it's like 20 degrees Celsius higher over the parking lot than it is over the forest. This, uh, you could call this a heat island. And, you know, some of the climate skeptics, they, they, they say, well, we're not really having global warming. It's just the, the urban heat island effect. Well, that is of scant consolation if we're turning more and more of the earth into a heat island. So this is, so yeah, so um, disrupting soil and cutting down forests that independent of carbon dioxide is already heating up the planet and disrupting climate. And you can look at it from the carbon lens as well. When you expose all that soil, it blows away. It washes away. It's not held there. So that carbon in the soil, it oxidizes and it goes into the atmosphere, massive amounts of carbon dioxide. It's the largest source actually of carbon, of atmospheric carbon dioxide. It's from, from uh, damaged land. And of course then forests, when they're cut down, they can no longer store carbon and, and the grasses can no longer sequester it. So this leads to um, 
a different set of priorities, a different set of policies that says that, and again, this is true for me, whether or not global warming is happening, that our top priority has to be to protect and regenerate, to protect and restore and heal the systems that maintain life, the living systems that maintain the conditions for life. And key to those is water. Water and carbon too, carbon in the form of soil, carbon in the form of biomass, carbon in the form of life. These are um, sacred substances. So, This can happen on every scale. Every person can take care of a little bit of life. But really what we need is a radical change in our agricultural system and, and a moratorium on any more deforesting of especially pristine first, uh, old growth forests. Um, those have a more powerful effect on maintaining climate equilibrium. And, and also to um, regenerate not just soil through better agricultural practices, but also to regenerate, to, re to restore wetlands and to regenerate um, marine ecosystems by having no fishing zones that should probably cover at least half the ocean so that the ocean can recover. You know, I'll maybe take it just one more, add one more thing to the, to the water paradigm, just that, um, that's as the uh, Standing Rock people said, water is life. If we do not respect the water, then life will not thrive. And I really, you know, can't say that the main focus should be water because everything's interconnected. To heal the water, you have to heal the soil. To heal the soil, you have to respect the plants. You have to um, allow biodiversity to thrive. You can't do monocrops anymore. You can't just extract anymore. You have to look at land as a being and say, what do you want? You have to listen and observe. You can't stamp a formula. You can't make a template that works in one place and apply it everywhere else. The industrial mindset does not work for earth healing. You can't send tr drones out with tree seeds and plant them willy nilly everywhere. How do you know that that's the right tree for that spot? How do you know that? Even if it's the right tree for the next valley over, how do you know it's right for that valley? And how do you know it's right for that spot on that valley? I can answer that question, how do you know it? You know it if you've been intimately familiar with that spot, if you've observed the land for decades or generations, and you know those trees like, like, like family, then you can be a caretaker of the land. Some people are kind of savants in this and they don't need decades or generations, but that's the mindset. Um, they at least start with that question. What wants to be here? From that mindset, miracles of healing can happen. And that mindset, I'm going to say, that is contrary to the scientific reductionistic worldview that says that there's no wanting outside of humans and maybe at a rudimentary level, you know, animals at a more primal level, wanting. There's nothing that wants to be here. That's a, a projection. Land doesn't want. Land doesn't dream. But I think that we have to begin to see land as a wanting being, to ask that question. What does the land want? What does the water want? What does the forest want? How can I participate in that? How can I serve that? How can I be part of a transition 
to a state of being that includes all of us, that's beautiful, in which all life benefits, not some life at the expense of the rest. Knowing that we're in this together. <laughs>